Great. This is joint work with David Berger at Duke, Andreas Costa is and Simon Mongi, my new colleague, and they're all here in the audience. So the modern monopsony literature is based on three paradigms. To generate labor market power, often rely on worker firm specific preference heterogeneity. So if you value a job over and above the wage that's paid, firms could potentially pay you less in your marginal product. Second common paradigm, search frictions. So search frictions can depress your outside option in bargaining and affect your rate of contacts and your wages, potentially can be less in your marginal product. The third paradigm is firm granularity. So think the finiteness of the number of firms in a market. Independent of the first two, if you have Bertrand competition or Cornell competition, you can generate equilibria at which workers are paid less than their marginal products. So what we're going to do in this paper is ask how these three separate mechanisms shape wages, job flows, and worker welfare. We're going to ask which of these mechanisms account for the wage markdown, which we're going to define to be the gap between what a worker is paid and their marginal revenue product of labor. The way that we're going to approach this question is we're going to propose a model that captures all three of these paradigms. We're going to estimate the model on matched employer employee data from Norway. And then we're going to quantify each source of these channels in average wage markdowns. In the conclusion, I'll tell you how this can help guide policy. So let me jump straight into the environment. So in the model, there's going to be many labor markets indexed by this lowercase j. You can think of a labor market here as being an occupation within a commuting zone, so dentists in Oslo or psychologists in, in Bergen. These labor markets are independent. Workers are not going to be able to flow across the labor markets. And we're going to assume that there is a single final good. Within each of these labor markets, J, there's going to be a measure of ex ante identical workers, after which they're either employed or unemployed and may have heterogeneous wage profiles based on their contacts. There's going to be a finite number MJ of firms that we're going to index by K. So K is going to take values one up through MJ within market J. So within that market J, within dentists in Oslo, I'm going to drop the, the subscripts. Firm K is going to produce with a linear production technology. ZK is their productivity, and they have a stock of workers NK that work at that firm. At home, workers are going to produce homogeneous amount B. Now, firms are optimizing. They're going to post VK vacancies. We're going to be solving for a Nash equilibrium in those VKs at a flow cost C of VK, where the convexity is governed by this parameter gamma. The combination of a firm's productivity and the convexity of this uh, cost of posting vacancies are going to pin down firm size in equilibrium. Now, let me talk about the search and matching protocol. This differs a bit from Cook, Paulson, and Robin. So all of the unemployed workers are going to apply for jobs. Some fraction less than one, psi e, of employed workers are going to apply for jobs. Some measure of those applications, xk, are going to reach a firm's desk. Then go into our matching function to tell us how many meetings occur. So the number of vacancies that measure of applications this matching function, along with the match efficiency, are going to pin down the measure of meetings. Crucially here, because of the granularity of the firms, if you're employed at a given firm K, you're going to partially direct your search. So you're only going to apply to firms that are not your current employer. Now, before matching, workers are going to draw an idiosyncratic preference shock. So worker I is going to draw an amenity uh, at firm K uniform where the lower bound of the support is zero and we're going to estimate the upper bound of that support it is observed both by the worker and the firm and it's constant during a match workers are going to maximize their flow utility over wages and this non-wage amenity discounted at a rate beta now as i mentioned before workers of firms observe epsilon and they're only going to consummate a match whenever surplus is greater than whatever is the outside option, whether you're poaching or hiring this person out of unemployment. Lastly, the bargaining is in Kahook, Paul, Sonny, Robin. They micro found this with an alternating offer game, which boils down to what looks like Bertrand competition pinning down the worker's outside option, and then Nash bargaining over the remaining surplus with a bargaining parameter 
theta. So let me just pause here and highlight the differences between what we're doing in the baseline Kahook, Pulsifinet, and Robin. So you're going to see concentration show up in this finiteness of number of firms. We've color coded these throughout the talks to, to, to correspond to the different paradigms. And the purple bit here is, uh, is the search and matching frictions. And the red component here, these non-wage amenities, gives us these new classical forces for markdowns. So those are the three wrinkles. So let's go into how we quantify this model. So in Norway, we approximately have access to what is the LEHD plus the CPS. Why is this crucial? Well, as in the CPS, in Norway, we observe occupations for the universe of workers. So we can define concentration, we can define markets based on occupations. We have data from 2006 to, to 2016. In that time period, we, we pool the data and we group, we define markets by grouping occupations within a commuting zone. That is going to map in our model notation to that lowercase j, our definition of a market. So how do we group occupations? Well, we, we, we begin with the 250 four-digit occupations that are present in Norwegian data. So think dentists, psychologists, and, and the like. What we do in a first step, pre-processing step, is we isolate 60 of these occupations at extremely high self-flow rates. So the flow rate conditional on making a job move back into its own occupation is greater than 50%. And these are your, your usual suspects, these sort of highly occupation licensed uh, 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 occupations, dentists and psychologists being two of our examples in, in Norway. The remaining 190 occupations, we cluster using a k-means algorithm. And we do this on the lower dimensional object of the occupation to occupation worker flow matrix. So this is a 190 by 190 matrix telling the rows telling you where you begin and the columns telling you which occupations you end up in the next month. So we cluster based on the similarity of those rows. All right. Now you have to come up with an optimal K star. So in the, the, the spirit of all of these machine learning algorithms, all these clustering algorithms, what we're going to do is pin down an optimal K star in every commuting zone. So it'll be a separate K star in Oslo as there is in, in Bergen or Stravanger um, to maximize goodness of fit, which is maximizing the average self flow rates. So we want them to self flow at a high rate, but we also want to penalize for overfitting. We want to rule out the degenerate solution of sticking all of the occupations into, into one cluster. So running our algorithm, we end up with about 83 clusters per commuting zone. So about 4,000 markets in, in Norway with a self-flow rate of about 51%. To benchmark this, we consider also three-digit occupations. So three-digit occupations would yield about 110 clusters per market. And there would be about 5,000 markets in Norway with a lower self-flow rate of 45%. If we were to adopt the Jarosz, Nimczyk, and Sorkin stochastic block method, so this is where you group firms based on worker flows, which is computationally intensive. They don't have the benefit of seeing occupations. They only see industries, and there the self-flow rate's about 41%. Importantly, when we run this clustering algorithm, about 70% of the workforce in Norway is in markets with at least 150 firms per market. So it looks fairly competitive. And you'll see this when we do some of our concentration experiments, we're not gonna get a lot of kick because most people are in fairly competitive markets. So let me give you an example of what these markets are. Let me put some names and labels to, to some of the notation. So consider a market, consider the commuting zone Oslo and consider two companies, dental firm ABC and, and law company XYZ. The dental firm hires dentists and hires secretaries. The law firm hires lawyers and hires secretaries. The lens of our framework, we're going to split these into three separate markets. So in the first market, that's going to be dentists in Oslo, and there's only one firm in this stylized example in that market. Potentially, they have monopsony power. In the second market are lawyers, same story is true. Lawyers in Oslo, one firm competing for the services of, of lawyers in Oslo. Secretaries, on the other hand, is going to look more competitive. The secretaries in Oslo market is going to have two firms who are competing head-to-head -head for the, the services of these secretaries. 
All right, so with markets in hand, what we're able to do is summarize the relationship between market concentration and job flows the way we haven't seen in existing data, for instance, in the United States. Now I'm gonna point out here that really us and the existing literature have no good instrument for, for Herfindahl's. Almost all the instruments you can think of don't satisfy the exclusion restriction. For instance, the local exposure to, to national exits will alter the Herfindahl market, certainly, but also changes the ladders of uh, the job rungs of the ladder in that market. Instead, what we're going to do is show you a benchmark set of covariances relying on two very different sources of variation. So if you write down a model in this literature, you should be able to compare to, to one of these sets of covariances and, and land on top of it. What we're going to use is within your occupation, cross-region variation in Herfindahl's. So you can think this set of variation compares dentists in Oslo to dentists in Bergen. You might worry, well, in Oslo, dentists are paid more, it's more competitive, they're sorting, and in Bergen is more concentrated, potentially they're paid less. So we also show you another separate set of variation, which uses within occupation region across time variation in Herfindahl. So you can think of comparing dentists in Oslo at day T to themselves at T plus one, where we ameliorate any concerns uh, regarding sorting. So this is what the variation looks like. We find a robust negative covariance between job flows and, and Herfindahl's. On the, on the x-axis is a residualized Herfindahl converted into a, a z-score. So these units are standard deviations. On the y-axis is a residualized E to E rate in percentage points. We see is that a two standard deviation increase in the Herfindahl associated with about a 0.05 percentage point reduction in the EE rate. Job flows are lower in Norway, so this actually corresponds to about a 10% reduction relative to the sample average. The job finding rate follows by one whole percentage point for that same variance in, in, in Herfindahl's, which also corresponds to about 10% of the sample average job finding rate in a given month in, in Norway. So with the market definitions in hand or definition of concentration, we're able to read MJ, the number of firms in each of these markets straight from the data. So we're gonna feed that into to our model. On average, there's about 73 firms per market in, in Norway. So these markets look fairly competitive, but our Herfindahl is gonna indicate that uh, there's uh, the competition's equivalent to about 10 equally sized uh, firms in the market. So it still is fairly concentrated. We're gonna pose a linear relationship between the number of workers in a market and the number of firms in a market. And we go through the paper and, and argue why and that's actually a fairly good fit in the data. So we split the parameters into three blocks. The first block has to do with the search and matching paradigm. The middle block has to do with the neoclassical amenities. And the last block has to do with concentration. So fairly uncontroversially, the match efficiency is pinned down by the unemployment rate and the on-the-job search intensity, psi E, is pinned down by the aggregate uh, E to E rate. The amenities are, only, are the only source of movements down the job ladder. So if we were to shut down the amenities, we were to set epsilon bar to zero, no one would flow down the job ladder in our model economy. So this is also fairly uncontroversial. The concentration, so there's two components to this, the first of which is a standard deviation of productivity, which we're going to estimate to match the standard deviation of log wages. Conditional on that productivity draw, how do we match concentration? Well, the vacancy cost elasticity, that curvature to posting vacancies, is really going to penalize firms, the more convex it is, for being disproportionately large. So what we end up with is a concentration that, as I mentioned before, concentration employment Herfindahl that is equivalent to 10 equally sized firms in a market. So 0.09 in a model, 0.08 in the data. Lastly, we're over-identified and we, we target the average relationship between the average wage in the Herfindahl and wage dispersion in the Herfindahl. What do these negative relationships mean in the data? A one standard deviation higher Herfindahl is associated with about a 2.5% lower wage level and 5% less wage dispersion. So Monopsy looks like it compresses wages. We also match non-targeted covariances of the EE and UE flows that I showed you on the last slide as a validation of our framework. So let me show you the first result in terms of wages. So we're gonna assume that wages are fixed until you receive an outside offer. 
As an accounting device, we're going to keep track of only a worker's promised value as a share of total surplus. So sigma is going to be the worker's surplus share. Putting these together, we get a closed form expression for wages in terms of surpluses. So the flow wage of a worker whose promised value is, uh, is uh, sigma of total surplus at firm K, who has an amenity draw epsilon, is given by your usual convex combination of what's produced in the match, so the marginal revenue product of that worker, ZK, and their outside option. But there's two extra wrinkles here. The first of which is there's going to be an amenity discount, and the second of which is you have the quit and promotion discount. So this first bit, the output share, comprises about 91% of the average wage in Norway. The opportunity cost is about 42%, and the amenity discount puts a downward pressure of about minus 20% on the wage, whereas a quit promotion discount is about minus 15%. Let me briefly talk about the economics of the amenity discount. So if you show up at a firm and you have very little uh, bargaining power, so you just showed up and you have no outside offers, your sigma could be quite low. It could be take a value of theta, which was 0.18 in our calibration. You would face a fairly significant uh, uh, amenity wage penalty. As your offers bid up more and more, as you meet more firms and sigma starts to approach one, you start to take more and more of the surplus, the amenity wage penalty disappears and the worker takes home their marginal product, ZK. So let me talk about our, our key counterfactuals. So uh, we're going to provide this decomposition to three paradigms. And ideally, what we would do is we would take MJ to infinity. But actually, conceptually, there's some issues with that that I'm going to talk about. Computationally, it's also infeasible for us to do that brute force. The paper, we provide approximation to this. But today, I'm going to show you a simpler experiment where we just double the number of firms in a market. The second, uh, which is reducing amenity dispersion to zero, which we're going to show you here. And the third of which would be to remove search entirely, but our models cast in discrete time. So we're going to do the best we can to allow everyone to meet every period. So this is the baseline economy. That's the Herfindahl I showed you in the calibration table. And the markdown is such that workers take home 79% of what they produce. So W over Z is uh, 0.79. I also call that a 21% markdown. The E rate's about a third of what it is in the United States, about half a percent per month. So let me show you the first experiment. The first experiment uh, we do in a very particular way, which is we take the Z vector in every market in Norway and we duplicate it, okay? So the top rung of the job ladder and the bottom rung of the job ladder are the same and every rung in between. It's just now you have to compete against your doppelganger. We're also going to double the number of workers to remove any mechanical density effects, okay? So this is a very particular experiment designed to isolate the role of pure concentration. What we find is that wages increase by about 0.7 percentage points, welfare goes up by a quarter of a percentage point, inequality increased by about 0.8 percentage points. Surprisingly to us, markdowns only narrowed by 1%. So workers used to take home 79% of what they produce. After we duplicate the set of firms, we get to only 80%. So a markdown narrowing of one percentage point. The mechanism for, for the wage gains and the wage inequality rising is that the bottom rungs of the job ladder are the same. When you come out of unemployment, you meet the least productive firm, you get paid about the same in either of these counterfactuals. But at the top now, Google has to compete against his doppelganger, all right? And you can, you can see that wages at the top fan out and they're kind of pinned down at the bottom and you get greater wage inequality as we increase competition. Second, we reduce the amenity dispersion to zero, but we keep being amenities fixed, okay? So we, we calibrate the average amenity so that we get it right, but we kill all of the dispersion. Markdowns here narrow significantly by, points, by seven percentage points. Interestingly, the Herfindahl triples. So you go to the top and you stay at the top. The amenities never draw these workers down the job ladder again. As a side effect of that, productivity goes up by almost seven percentage points, almost eight percentage points. Lastly, we reduce search frictions and you see immediately here the EE rate uh, uh, more than doubles. There's an increase in the Herfindahl. Uh, and there's a there's a large narrowing of markdowns. So markdowns narrow almost 14 percentage points. So in the last few minutes, let me talk about bargaining and, and conclude. So when we doubled the number of firms in the market, we were surprised that there was very little effect on markdowns. And then what we realized in the course of this project was that a lot of the concentration was hardwired 
in the duopsony in the bargaining process. So how do we get at this in a counterfactual? We do experiment here where we add a third firm to the bargaining table. So whenever you meet a firm, you meet the next best ranked firm. In partial equilibrium, this doesn't affect allocations. You're always going to flow to the top ranked firm. We're only letting the next best ranked firm show up. Okay, so you're always going to flow to the same place. It only moves the workers outside option. Here to rank firms, we need to get rid of the amenities. Okay, so to cleanly rank the firms, we're going to start from a baseline where we have one single amenity. We bring the third firm to the table and markdowns reduce by almost 11 percentage points, suggesting a large role for, for strategic interactions. So large that it's equivalent to tripling the worker bargaining power. We think much research needs to be gone into understanding the source of these strategic interactions and opening this black box of, of the bargaining protocol. So let me conclude. So we estimated Hook, Paulson, and Robin with a finite number of firms and this new classical source of markdowns. We found that about a third of the markdowns in steady state, so of the 21 percentage points, almost 10 were due to, to, to non-wage amenities. Half were due to this duopsonistic, hardwired uh, strategic interaction in the bargaining protocol, and two-thirds could be ascribed to search and matching frictions, which are perhaps immutable with respect to policy. Concentration in its pure form, holding bargaining fixed, had small effects on markdowns, but large welfare and wage effects. And the non-additivity I should point out here is because the model is highly non-linear. In, in ongoing work, we're looking at the minimum wage, which really addresses the non-wage am, uh, uh, amenities and the duopsonistic uh, wage bargaining. And in, in, in very recent work, we were looking at merger guidelines where the Penguin Random House Simon Schuster merger really put monopsony at the forefront. And we're finding that if you were to apply product market guidelines to the labor market, the 1982 guidelines would leave workers unharmed, where if you would apply the current 2010 guidelines, workers would lose in your average merger in the United States. So I'll leave it there. Thanks.